club in English. The image from the New England Journal shows the backside of a 73-year-old woman who presented to a dermatology clinic with an 11-month history of a rash. Uh, it itches. And we're asked to suggest what this might be. And five diagnoses are offered. Um, well, this is not a fungus. So I think we can forget about Tinea versicolor. Uh, this is not dermatomyositis. Uh, this is not lupus erythematosus. We don't see evidence of open necrosis, although the rash could be migratory in nature. So we're stuck with erythema geratum repens, which makes sense since the rash has a gyrating pattern on this woman's backside. And that's the correct diagnosis. Uh, this rash is associated with systemic malignancy, and it's important that we give some thought to what sort of rashes appear in people that really have an underlying cancer. And in a 73-year-old woman that suddenly shows up with a rash that doesn't look like an allergy and nothing that she's ever had before, that would certainly be an important differential to make. Dermatomyositis is also associated with cancer. As a matter of fact, 50% of people with dermatomyositis, particularly older adults, have an underlying malignancy that should be searched for. Now, myositis means muscle, and muscle pain and weakness are um, characteristic, and we can see in this biopsy a uh, large infiltration around the major fascicles of round cells, but also here between individual muscle cells, lots of round cell infiltration. The rash commonly involves the hands. It's um, violaceous or pink in color. And this is a typical example, quite different than what our patient showed today. But lupus erythematosus, the wolf, this is a designation from several hundred years ago. Uh, this patient shown here uh, was photographed over a hundred years ago. Um, here is a young lady that has the typical rash that we associate with lupus erythematosus. That's not the case in the patient that we presented today. Here's an, another example of erythema geratum repens, which is associated with underlying malignancies. In this example, it looks quite similar to what the patient that was shown in the New England Journal exhibited. Uh, the tumors are mostly solid tumors, carcinomas of uh, stomach, lung, prostate, esophage esophageal cancer, and others. Um, but hematologic malignancies can also be responsible. Tinea versicolor, a rash generally seen in the tropics. Uh, this middle picture is uh, very characteristic. Um, the offending organism can be easily uh, scraped off with a scalpel blade and examined under potassium hydroxide preparation. On a microscope slide, Malassezia furfur is a common agent that results in tinea versicolor and the condition responds to a simple treatment or goes away on its own. Erythema necrolytum migrans. This is a migratory rash also occurring generally in older adults with an underlying malignancy. Uh, glucagon producing tumors are characteristically associated with this rash, but it causes blistering and necrotic lesions as exhibited in these, photo in these photographs, different than what the patient that we saw today. What's interesting is this rash is hardly indistinguishable from rashes that are seen with zinc deficiency or biotin deficiency, which belong to the differential diagnosis. 
The first disease entity that will um, interest us today is sickle cell anemia. I went to medical school in Philadelphia, large population of African Americans, and sickle cell anemia was common in our pediatric clinic, and we saw a lot of it. When we suspected the diagnosis, we put a few drops of blood on a microscope slide, put over a cover slip, and then used a, an ointment such as Vaseline to go around the cover slip so that air could not get in there, let the preparation sit for 15 minutes, and then we did a peripheral smear, and this, uh, the anoxia causes the cells to sickle in larger amounts, and this is a typical example of a peripheral smear of such a preparation in a patient with sickle cell anemia. We know since the 1950s that this condition involves a, an amino acid exchange in the beta chain. At the sixth position, a glutamine is substituted for a valine, and when that's the case, and the um, cells are exposed to a relative hypoxia, uh, there's a change in uh, the structure of the beta chain that results in this sickle cell shape. Linus Pauling cleared up this disease, and he did so with help from Max Perutz that did the X-ray diffractions to show the structure of hemoglobin. So this has been known before molecular biology, and now we know a great deal about this disease. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disease. Uh, the sickle cell heterozygous state occurs in about 10% of at least American Afro-Americans uh, that, that live in the United States. In sub-equatorial Africa, it's probably even more common, uh, so that um, uh, homozygosity results in the disease. There are characteristic x-ray findings. Um, aseptic hip necrosis is common. Uh, signs that are associated with increased erythropoiesis, uh, dental malformations. And if you look at the lateral chest x-ray of this individual, what we see here is the vertebra look uh, abnormal and uh, each uh, vertebral space has a fish mouth appearance that's characteristic on x-ray examination so that uh, the diagnosis can also be made on x-ray examination. Now we treat this condition with hydroxyurea and here is the structure of hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is also used to treat some hematologic malignancies because it interferes with the actions of ribonuclear uh, RNA reductase. Um, when given to people with uh, sickle cell anemia where there's marked erythropoiesis uh, continually in the attempt to generate new erythrocytes, uh, this erythropoiesis is uh, um, down-regulated in the presence of uh, uh, hydroxyurea, and that results in the increased synthesis of hemoglobin F, which is not great for adults, but at least the cells then no longer sickle. So there's a modest increase in hemoglobin values, but that's not the point. The cells no longer that are produced have a lesser tendency to sickle. And uh, that's actually been the routine treatment for sickle cell anemia, homozygous sickle cell anemia for the last 20 years. So again, the main action of hydroxyurea is to cause an increase in the intracellular concentration of fetal hemoglobin, and that keeps the cells from sickling. So sickled cells cause endothelial damage, results in thrombosis, pain crises, uh, uh, all areas of the body that are particularly hypoxemic, like the kidney, for instance, uh, are particularly subjected to damage and we can avoid that situation, that state of affairs, at least to a degree, by giving patients hydroxyurea. So you can view hydroxyurea as sort of a poor man's gene therapy to alter uh, the state of affairs in people with sickle cell anemia. So I thought this problem was solved. 
But uh, this study was done in uh, sub-equatorial Africa to see if hydroxyurea also works in Africa. It wouldn't occur to me that it wouldn't, but that was what was done here. So these children were not randomized to treatment. They all got, got hydroxyurea. And uh, the idea was to have a large cohort of children, African children to see how they got better. So the real world is down here. And what we see is the cumulative index of any sort of uh, endpoint, death, withdrawal, or the combination of the two were endpoints. And uh, the children had no problem in taking hydroxyurea. And the compliance in the study, as this graph shows, was excellent. So withdrawal from treatment, children moving or not believing in the treatment or whatever have you, was rare. Uh, death of the children was also rare, and if the two happened together, the incidence as the prevalence we would expect would double as this graph shows. But that was relatively uncommon and uh, was featured in less than 6% or about 6%, 6 to 7% of the children. And what we see here is all adverse events got better, pretty much all, with very few exceptions, hydroxyurea would be expected to cause neutropenia. That did indeed occur. Uh, and um, uh, anemia didn't get much better, uh, but uh, the sickling stopped. And all these other adverse events, such as uh, pain crises, acute chest syndrome, stroke, uh, uh, these things were reduced by at least 50%. Interestingly enough, it's believed that the heterozygous SA hemoglobin is resistant to malaria. Nonetheless, the children with sickle cell anemia that were treated with hydroxyurea got substantially less malaria, presumably because they were less sick. Their transfusion requirements were less and they also got less infections. So if we look at their fetal hemoglobins, <clears throat> prior to the initiation of treatment, it's about 10%. Uh, our values are two to three uh, percent. This increased to 21 uh, to about 25 percent in these uh, children that were treated. Their hemoglobin values only increased from 7.3 grams per deciliter to 8.3 grams per deciliter. But again, that isn't the point. The point is to stop sickling. And then all these other complications, sickle cell related events, malaria, vasoocclusive pain, transfusion requirements, chest syndrome and death all decrease substantially. So we can conclude that hydroxyurea works as well in Africa as it does everywhere else. The next topic in the New England Journal concerns uh, bypass grafting. And usually veins are used since mammary arteries are more difficult and there's only usually only one of them that can be harvested. So veins, saphenous veins are used and they're usually harvested traditionally uh, by a second operation, obviously involving this incredibly long incision going along the entire leg to get this vein out. Now, this procedure can also be done endoscopically. Uh, so while one surgeon is working on the chest, another surgeon uh, physician is harvesting the vein, and this can be done endoscopically which involves only three much smaller wounds and might be some advantage for the patient uh, when he's subjected to getting these bypass procedures as shown here on the right. So here patients undergoing cabbage operations were randomized to either open vein harvesting or endoscopic vein harvesting to see if there would be any difference in outcomes from the two procedures. And the, 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 the primary outcome is major adverse cardiac events, including death from any cause, non-fatal myocardial infarction, et cetera. And secondary outcomes is how do the legs do in terms of infection, antibiotic requirements, et cetera. And so if we go back and look at these patients, usually older patients, mostly men, previous smokers, diabetes, obese, hypertension, all the things that people with cardiovascular risk that need bypass surgery might have. And some of the patients here had heart failure. So this is what we would expect. 
And if we look at any differences in, uh, in the patient groups, um, in, uh, we can conclude that the randomization requirements work pretty well so that there's no difference in the two cohorts. Now, we wouldn't think that uh, wherever the vein, whether the veins were harvested by an open up procedure or an endoscopic procedure, that the veins would be any different. And they weren't because the primary endpoints were no different. But the rate of wound complications was lower in the endoscopic harvested group. And the amount of antibiotics that they required, or at least what conclusions that their physicians reached were also favorable in the endoscopic group. So I think endos endoscopic vein removal is the way to go and should probably become the standard of care. And we would like to congratulate our surgeon friends for conducting a randomized trial to see which procedure is better. Now, this next trial is also a surgical trial. And again, we have to congratulate our surgical colleagues because this procedure is much more difficult than merely harvesting veins in the leg. Here, we're talking about invasive esophagectomy for cancer. And this is a difficult operation, and it's amazing how much surgery has improved that this kind of procedure, which requires a thoracic intervention after all, uh, can be approached with an endoscopic technique and of course, the procedures aren't shown in the New England Journal, so I have to go back to the literature to find some pictures of how this operation is done. So this operation, which was a, from a surgical journal, is entitled Hybrid and Total Minimally Invasive Esophagectomy, How Do I Do It? And I think the answer to the question is go to a center where people do this well and learn how to do it. And so the operations that are discussed here are uh, the McEwen operation and all that involves a neck anastomosis or the Ivor Lewis operation that involves a chest anastomosis where a limited thoracotomy is necessary to do this chest anastomosis. So it looks like this, a laparoscopic division of the left gastric artery. That's a good idea to ligate that one. And uh, there's some nice pictures of how the, uh, through endoscopes, how this is done. This is laparoscopic gastric tubulization. Not quite sure what that is, but I'm glad they know how to do it. Uh, this is transthoracic esophagogastric anastomosis performed here. So we can look at this and see that this is serious business. And um, the patients are maneuvered throughout this operative intervention here in various positions so that the surgeons can do this operation. Uh, with these instruments. The thoracic duct, we don't want to cut that one or we have big problems. And here the thoracic duct is secured with a hemolock clamp. Uh, that's the thoracic duct here. Here's the aorta, don't want to cut that. Uh, the azagous vein, we need to maintain this uh, natural connection so that the thoracic duct will work after the operation. So this is about what this operation is about. So in the New England Journal, we look at a trial, hybrid minimally invasive esophagectomy for esophageal cancer, patients randomized to usual open surgery, which has a lot of complications and is quite morbid, compared to this hybrid surgery, the Ivor Lewis procedure that I just showed you. So 207 patients that were operated on for esophageal cancer were randomized to these two operations. And usually men uh, usually smoked a lot. They're not obese. Uh, and um, uh, their tumors were uh, classified by biopsy. And uh, most of them sit in the middle third of the esophagus and uh, uh, or most of them sit in the lower third of the esophagus and some in the middle third. So these are lower down gastric cancers uh, or esophageal cancers where these tumors usually occur. And what we see here is that there is a 77% lower risk of major intraoperative and postoperative complications. So that's a substantial decrease in postoperative complications and the complications are usually pulmonary in nature. And so 
these pulmonary complications can be substantially reduced by this procedure. Now, there are only 200 patients in this study, so it's fairly difficult to draw um, absolute statistical inference, but we can look at the hazard ratios and they're reduced substantially a percentage of patients who were alive. Uh, it looks to me that I'd rather have the hybrid operation than the open procedure, irrespective of the p-values here. Percentage of patients without an event, that means uh, major complications, is also less in the hybrid operatively treated patients. So this, again, a randomized trial of operations, congratulate our surgeon friends, looks like people are going to have to learn this newer operation compared to the older operation. So the next paper in the New England Journal occur, uh, involves the WHIM syndrome, warts, hypogamma globulin anemia, immunodeficiency, and myelocathexis. Myelocathexis is a technical term indicating that you can't mobilize your neutrophils, get them out of the bone marrow into the periphery to fight infection. The technical term for that is called myelocathexis. This, thank goodness, is a, a rare disease. It involves mutations in a chemokine receptor called CXCR4. And CXCR4 mediates myelocathexis and is involved in hypo in, in immunoglobulin production and things of this nature. And this gene here is mutated into a truncated version that can't be removed from the membrane. So this basically results in a gain of function, too much function from CXCR4. And uh, as we can see here, the poor patient in this picture, the poor patients get bronchiectasis. And as we can see from the title of this disease, they must get warts. And so this is this brief report in the New England Journal involves Plerixophore. And Plerixophore is a CXCR4 antagonist. And instead of teaching, uh, treating these patients with GMCSF or GCSF, I would think that treating them with Plerixophore would be a more ideal treatment. And the investigators apparently thought so too, because that's how they treated these um, patients with the Huym syndrome, a very rare genetic disease. Okay, so here we see the patients with the Huym syndrome, and here they all got G CSF beforehand, and when they get Plerixophore, they say, thank you very much, and uh, their white cells can now leave the bone marrow and their, uh, um, so the cell number, uh, there are three patients described here and all three of the patients got better and uh, their warts got less and their uh, various, if we look at their bone marrows, I mean, if you can't get the cells out of the bone marrow, the bone marrow is packed. But once you can get the cells out of the bone marrow, then you can see fat globules and normal appearing bone marrow. And this is, a, this is a bone marrow biopsy. This is a touch preparation. And this next slide uh, picture involves reticulum staining. So it looks like their bone marrows got better. Also nice is that their warts got less. And so these patients really have massive attacks of uh, papilloma virus um, initiated warts and the common around the fingers and their hands got substantially better uh, with this Plerixophore treatment. And so if, if looking at the supplement, it looks even more dramatic. We can see the marked improvement in their patient, in, in these uh, ward attacks on these patients and their hands get better and their immunoglobulins and neutrophil counts and other features of this rare disease also improve. Now the review in the New England Journal is also important because it involves acute infections and the risk from having a myocardial infarction. Uh, this state of affairs is probably not that much appreciated by physicians, but patients that are as old as I am, if they get low bar pneumonia, their chances of having a myocardial infarction is increased 600%. 
And if they just get a bad cold, it's increased 300%. And if they have pneumonia with positive blood cultures, then it's increased 600%. And uh, that state of affairs stays there for weeks until the infection goes away. Now, as also pointed out in this review, it involves any infection. So urinary tract infections, for instance, are also associated with a higher risk of having an acute cardiovascular event. And we can imagine why. People that get cardiovascular events have blood vessels that look like this and have these awful plaques. And uh, uh, they're prone to rupture anyway, and you hope that they don't. <clears throat> but if we get an infection and release a, a bunch of um, cytokines and TNF-alpha and high catecholamines that increase oxygen demand, core temperature, heart rate, myocardial contractility, then we can might imagine that these plaques would be more prone to rupture. And that indeed seems to be the case. And if the patients get sepsis, uh, they commonly get cardiomyopathy, not always clinically apparent, but it might be. And if they happen to die and you can look at their hearts under the microscope, you can see increased inflammation and in these spotty areas, of necrosis and things of this nature, even if they don't have a ruptured plaque. So that's important to know because Influenza virus vaccination lowers the risk of a cardiovascular event by 36%. And vaccine, uh, pa patients my age or patients with chronic illnesses, dialysis patients, etc., should all be vaccinated against various strains of pneumococci. And that also decreases the risk of myocardial infarction. It's better than a taking a statin. So, Physicians need to be aware of this and get their patients vaccinated. And if they do get an acute event or pneumonia, uh, they should check them out to make sure that they don't have myocardial infarction. And here's a dramatic patient in the New England Journal. This is a two week old baby girl. And so she's two weeks old, gone home, and then the mother brings her back to pediatric clinic because of uh, this conjunctivitis that this young child has. And the differential diagnosis here is gonorrhea or chlamydia. And chlamydia trachomatis used to be the most common cause of blindness in the world. I don't know if that's still the case because there have been substantial inroads made against uh, uh, trachoma, which is caused by chlamydia, which are also present in the vaginal tract and is basically also a uh, um, sexually transmitted disease. So this young child was treated uh, with erythromycin and her parents were both treated with uh, acitromycin uh, to treat this condition. Now when I was in medical school and uh, we all worked in the newborn nursery and we all worked in labor and delivery and our job as medical students is every newborn got silver nitrate eye drops as prophylaxis against this condition. And I was rather curious why this child didn't get silver nitrate eye drops. Well, it documents how well I know the literature uh, because it turns out that there was a randomized controlled trial published almost 25 years ago looking at uh, the prophylaxis against ophthalmia neonatorum, which is what this youngster had. And in this wonderful study, single author study, the newborns who were randomized to tetracycline ointment erythromycin ointment, or my favorite, silver nitrate eye drops, which I had always been taught were effective prophylaxis uh, against uh, ophthalmia neonatorum. And the way, and as this randomized controlled trial showed 25 years ago, all three treatments were basically worthless. So I learned that uh, actually prophylaxis against ophthalmia neonatorum is not trivial. And there is, to my knowledge, at the moment, no effective, well-accepted prophylaxis against ophthalmia neonatorum. So we have to look out for it and treat it when it occurs. Now, the patient from the last week that had tracheolization of the esophagus, that's the picture on the right, first had to have his spaghetti meal removed because he actually presented, as I learned in this follow-up, uh, short vignette, uh, presented with uh, esophageal obstruction. 
So once the spaghetti was removed, here's tracheolization. Now this patient was treated with the um, omeprazole for eight weeks, which did nothing against this condition, didn't make him better at all. So then the physicians began an eight-week course of fluticasone given locally and a six-food elimination diet. Uh, this is a, 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 an eosinophil, this is an allergic disease, this eosinophilic esophagitis. It requires a biopsy to show all the eosinophils, but this tracheolization is characteristic and dramatic. And with that, one year follow-up, the patient reported no further symptoms of food impaction. Now, which one of these foods caused the allergy wasn't stated in this vignette, but here are the usual suspects. Wheat, milk, soy, nuts, eggs, and seafood. Next case. Shown here, are the Green Berets. That's an elite unit in the United States military uh, that is sent to awful places where wars occur. And what's shown here are the enlisted men. Uh, we call them the grunts, or in German, Lanza. Uh, these are not officers. These are the people that are on the boots on the ground that are really doing the work. And that's what our patient of the week in the New England Journal is about. This is a 34-year-old Green Beret, an enlisted man that served in the U.S. Army Rangers for eight years as a medic. Uh, he spent three deployments in Iraq. A, a deployment used to be 12 months. I believe that's still the case. Uh, so he spent three years in Iraq, not in a row, but at various intervals. And uh, he was subject to all sorts of, was wounded several times and was involved in explosions and uh, the stress of this kind of awful work. And when he was discharged from the army, and incidentally he received an honorable discharge, so his behavior was uh, uh, quite acceptable while he was serving, he had trouble as a civilian and um, had symptoms of depression and he had thoughts about suicide and he had what we call flashbacks and he uh, couldn't get along and he ended up drinking too much alcohol and it's also marijuana and various things and he was seen by the Veterans Administration, also various physicians and a whole variety of drugs were attempted here. Uh, sumatriptan, ibuprofen, prednisone, uh, topiramate, amitriptyline, and these were tried with minimal degrees of success. So this patient also reported being constantly on guard, sort of paranoid feelings, easily startled. He had no more interest in his surroundings, anhedonia, this is called when you're no longer interested in uh, sexual behavior, had difficulty concentrating, anorexia and fatigue, and was defensive and couldn't get along with people and uh, uh, had a whole variety of somatic complaints that uh, no substrate was found, and then laboratory tests were done, and here's a whole table of uh, uh, pretty much normal borderline liver enzyme changes on one of these uh, examinations, but not on the other, and uh, so no direction here. So flashbacks. Um, I gave the German translation here, uh, which we can talk about in the next hour. Uh, these uh, feelings of um, heat and photophobia and uh, sonophobia and these various complaints. He tried treating these with cold baths and benzodiazepines, didn't help. Patient's father had depression and his mother and father and paternal uncle all had a, some histories of alcohol abuse and drug abuse, but this is common worldwide. Patient had limited his alcohol intake, but he did smoke marijuana daily, but otherwise used no illicit drugs, no pain medicines, for instance, 
and uh, was ingesting various medications that were given by sub subscription and uh, they didn't help very much. So a urine toxicology screen was positive for cannabinoids, but negative for amphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, cocaine, opiates, and fencyclidine. So a diagnosis was made. And then the discussant mentions all the things that we would place in a differential diagnosis with a patient this kind of history. Uh, neurological diseases could be, uh, encephalitis, meningitis, brain tumors, various things that one might think about, gastrointestinal disease that could be associated with this, also involving perhaps uh, um, nutritional disturbances, endocrine disorders, toxic exposures, there's a pretty good candidate, uh, uh, other psychiatric disturbances, mood and anxiety disorders, and traumatic brain injury. Uh, which require, and uh, at least one sort of imaging study should be done to rule out some sort of structural brain problem. This patient was involved in numerous explosions and might very well have had some traumatic brain injury, although that wasn't the issue here. I love these American euphemisms, Operation Iraq Freedom. wonder how the Iraqis feel about it. Operation Enduring Freedom, when the first operation apparently didn't work. The discussant here makes the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and points out that eight criteria are necessary for this, and these are listed by a table here, uh, to make this fairly difficult but nevertheless common diagnosis that involves about 17% of the soldiers that served in Iraq, and uh, perhaps half of the uh, 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 um, twice as many, the, the veteran population has something, has this disorder totally for about 6%, but in the Iraq veterans, this is particularly high. So this patient received Acitralopram, which is another selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and uh, was subjected to multiple sessions of prolonged uh, um, psychotherapy uh, termed exposure therapy, which is an evidence-based trauma-focused method of psychotherapy that seems to help these patients. And he gets some better. And you would think that somebody that is educated as a medic in civilian life would perhaps be able to get employment as a ambulance attendant or as a medic. At least he should have a educational requirements for that kind of work. So that's the discussion here. This is an important topic and uh, general physicians have to be familiar with it and have some approach to these patients. Now in the England, New England Journal, I also learned of a new diagnosis and that diagnosis is vaping. I had never heard of vaping, but apparently uh, US teenagers are enamored by these electro, not electronic really, electric cigarettes. And uh, they can get a rush from a, a substantial exposure to the nicotine with these electric with these e-cigarettes, and this is called vaping. And vaping is increasing at a phenomenal rate. So this is uh, some vapors here in this study. And uh, the prevalence in 2017 was 11% among, among 12th graders, and now it's 21%, which is all, a, a doubling in vaping in the last 12 months. And that includes, uh, there's also a substantial increase and younger children as well. So vaping is going to be a problem. Then a follow-up on this obesity study from Leipzig that was in the New England Journal about three months ago. You'll remember that this study indicated that uh, cho uh, newborn or children that are obese at age one are likely to be obese at age six and are likely to become obese adults in this long uh, cohort study. So. In response to a letter to the editor, the authors give us more data. And the one thing that we find out is that the mothers of fat children uh, watch a lot of television. And if they have a body mass index, they watch 
more television than if they have a normal body mass index. And if their children are obese, uh, they watch more television. And uh, um, if, if we look at the television watching among the obese mothers that watch a lot of television, their kids watch more television too. Now these are associations, and I'm not indicating that television somehow has a caloric effect that results in obesity, but it probably does impair motor activities. And um, so that, I, that interested me. Question in the New England Journal concerns, concerns a patient with stable angina pectoris, and uh, he gets aspirin and a statin, and he still has complaints, and which one of these drugs would appeal to you? And um, isosorbide dinitrate is actually a pretty good candidate, uh, but the answer is metoprolol, and uh, diltiazem might also be helpful. So in the Lancet, I now have access to this SGLT2 inhibitor study, uh, and it's a meta-analysis, and I think it's worth taking a more detailed look at. And so this is an, a meta-analysis of three studies that have been done on SGLT2 inhibitors, empafiglosin, canagliflozin, and tapagliflozin, all similar sponsored by different companies, obviously. Large number of participants here, in one study 17,000 here, 10,000 here, 7,000. And what we see here is large vessel, uh, minimizing large vessel disease, or in patients that have large vessel disease and multiple risk factors is not this great. But if we look at uh, uh, an evaluation that involves a meta-analysis on hospitalizations for heart failure coupled with cardiovascular death, there's a substantial reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure. I have difficulty believing that this is solely due to naturesis, so I'm not quite sure how this works. And what we also see is that patients' uh, uh, renal disease, and I'm not quite sure how this works either, but this would be a ramification of small vessel disease, is substantially reduced by these SGLT2 inhibitors. And what's exciting about these results is um, uh, up until several years ago, we had nothing that was of any value, to, in my view, for treating patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus other than metformin. So we now have uh, GLP-1 agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, and they seem to have a substantial positive influence on patients with diabetes mellitus, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, the other papers in the New England Journal that I can't access, probably doesn't matter, but this is a, a, a randomized trial of patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. This is a very unhappy diagnosis if metastases have occurred. And in this study, patients were randomized to PD-1 inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab, and the other group got the usual, which is platinum-based therapy or, or also an antibody against EGF receptor. And what we see here is the result was that the patients with pembrolizumab did a little better. Uh, they lived one month longer than the patient that got usual care, uh, but that was statistically significant. And they also had less side effects, which I could imagine would be the case. And the other paper in the, new, uh, in the Lancet involved um, influencing the course of events in patients with asymptomatic atherosclerotic disease. And how can we get these patients to lower their Framingham risk score or European systemic coronary risk score? And what was done in this large study is the patients were recruited that had risk uh, and they were randomized to um, um, not only the usual diagnostic measures, but a, a, a second ultrasound session, plus telephone calls from the nurse giving the results of trying to get the patients to go to their primary care physicians to get their Framingham risk scores reduced. So here we have this nice Swedish doctor and he's looking at the patients, looks like he has a pretty mangy looking carotid artery and perhaps he should do something about it. So I checked out my own Framingham risk score. Unfortunately, the primary issue here is being male and being old. 
can't fix those two problems. Uh, the computer didn't like my HDL cholesterol, but I'm sorry, that's an accurate value. Uh, and I have more than 10% risk of having an event in the next 10 years. I'll give you a follow-up on what happens. <laughs> so the case in the Lancet is also, this is a 28-year-old woman that comes in with shortness of breath and she feels tired and uh, Basically, there's not anything else. So she has dyspnea and cough and some chest discomfort. Pulmonary function tests were not really reported, but she has, uh, patients with this condition don't have a sign of obstructive or restrictive disease of major consequence. And so what we're stuck with doing is a CT, which is wonderful imaging. And what we see in this patient is a, these, a bunch of cystic vacuoles here but we don't see nodules. And for reasons that weren't clear to me is this patient had vascular endothelial growth factor D levels measured. I've heard of VEGFA. I'm familiar with VEGFB. I know what VEGFC does, but I'd never heard of VEGFD. And I still don't know exactly what it does, but her level was elevated at 1300 picograms per milliliter. So we're asked to identify what this is and what it might have to do with VEGFD. So the question is, VEGFD is a, how do we interpret it? Nonspecific, do a biopsy, or this is, uh, indicates the presence of Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or VEGFD is supportive of a, di of a diagnosis of lymphangioliomatosis, and VEGFD levels indicate that the patient should get his folliculin gene sequenced, or he might have the Bert Hogg Dubé syndrome. Well, I had to look up what the answer for this was. What puzzled me is this patient had no evidence of tuberous sclerosis, which is associated with lymphangioliomatosis. I knew that, but this patient doesn't have that. But as we learn in this report, is VEGFD levels support the diagnosis of lymphangioliomatosis that can also occur in patients that don't have evidence of tuberous sclerosis and have no mutations in the two genes that are responsive, responsible for tuberous sclerosis. So this is an, an example of lymphangioliomatosis and the point here is merely these cystic lesions without anything else. There are no nodules or other things that are associated with no evidence of brachiactasis or these other things, merely these cystic lesions. And um, this occurs in uh, women, usually younger women. Uh, they may have tuberous sclerosis, but it also can occur sporadically, although I would think that this pathway involving mTOR, and um, here are the genes that are uh, t uh, t uh, TS, uh, TS, what is it against, tuberous sclerosis complex uh, mutations that produce the protein Hamerton. Um, mTOR pathway is involved in the production of uh, these cystic lesions, and there's a schemata. I found a review in the European Respiratory uh, re review journal that gives us an idea about how this disease might occur and also mentions the role of VEGF, not VEGFC, which is actually responsible for lymphatic vessels, but VEGFD, which is associated with this disease. Now, I couldn't access the review in the Lancet, so I picked the one in the JMA, which I thought was a great review anyway and uh, reminded me of Dr. Baselga, Jose Baselga, uh, who led the cancer program at Sloan Kettering in New York. So his name is Jose, and uh, Sloan Kettering said, no way, Jose, and he was fired. It turns out that Dr. Baselga served as physician in chief at Sloan Kettering after it was reported that he failed to disclose millions of dollars in financial ties with pharmaceutical companies. 
Whether or not he stuck all that in his own pocket, I don't know. But we don't have to cry for him because immediately after he was fired, four days after he was fired, AstraZeneca picked up his contract. So I assume that he is now residing in Göteborg. Well, the review in the JMA concerns medical marketing in the United States between 1997 and 2016. And despite all these disclosure statements that we continually uh, have to fill out and uh, the emphasis on sponsoring and you don't get any ballpoint pens anymore, hardly, uh, and free meals seldom and those nice vacations that we used to get, don't get those anymore. But nevertheless, the pharmaceutical industry has increased its marketing by 30%. And what we see here is um, what's increased here, the, the, the amount that propaganda to physicians has increased a little bit, but what's increased dramatically is direct to consumer marketing. It used to be against the law to do this, but now with reinterpretations of the right of free speech, and we certainly wouldn't want to inhibit the drug companies and saying whatever they want to on Fox News. Uh, this has increased dramatically. So here are some examples. Um, total amount, marked increase. And the reason is advertising via television. I pick up on this when I'm in the United States. I turn on CNN when I'm running on the treadmill. And I learn about all sorts of new conditions, a new disease that I'd never even heard of before. Testosterone deficiency affects all older men, so I must have it. The name of this disease is low T. Uh, so that's where this money is going. And uh, the amount that's uh, this is uh, peddling prescription drugs and disease of awareness of things like low T has increased dramatically as opposed to health services, which has gone up a little bit, but less so. And if we look at what are they selling? Diabetes, big topic. And I guess and this is even, this report is before SGLT2 inhibitors and before GLP agonists. So this was all advertisement for uh, products that in my view are worthless. Uh, dermatology is a big sale point. Cancer does pretty well. And uh, osteoporosis has fallen off since uh, since solendronate is uh, quite inexpensive, so that's dropped dramatically, but all these other things are up. Uh, giving away free samples has increased a little bit, but now it's going up, uh, down again. Office detailing has been pretty constant, and a uh, good thing medical journals are pretty much, that's decreasing, that's being we're being spared that. Now, what's also interesting is that when the FDA is bothered by advertising, uh, they don't fine the drug companies, they send them nasty letters. So getting a nasty letter, uh, nasty letters to drug companies over this period of time as, from the FDA has de decreased dramatically as opposed to their direct consumer advertising, which has increased dramatically. That's also interesting. So disease awareness campaign. So at any rate, uh, how has the marketing of prescription drugs uh, changed from 1997 to 2016? So it's up 30% and uh, controls over this activity uh, have decreased substantially. So I guess this is all concerns the right of free speech. So we're going to end the session with this case report, which I think is interesting. An 18-year-old eight, young boy comes in with bone pain. His left hip hurts, particularly when he's squatting. And what we, uh, some laboratory values, calcium's normal and parathyroid hormone's normal and all this various things, but his phosphate level is twice normal. Uh, so uh, 2.1, uh, 2.10 millimoles per liter, this would be about eight milligrams per deciliter, so that his phosphate value is about twice normal. What, uh, what's, what's going on here? He has normal renal function. And how do you get hyperphosphatemia if you have normal renal function? And what he, if we look at his x-ray, he has this huge calcified tumorous mass here. And in CT, 
uh, he looks like a dialysis patient, but his renal function is normal. Dialysis patients get these sorts of things if we don't increase, if we don't control their phosphorus level. But he's got this, what is keeping this young man from excreting his phosphate load? And what we learn is that this is an example of familial tumoral calcinosis. And familial tumoral calcinosis is, thank goodness, rare. But we get rid of phosphate through phosphate transporters in the renal tubule. And they're driven by FGF23. And FGF23 is uh, regulated by the gout family transfers of, uh, of proteins that are involved with uh, activating these things. And the adapter protein to FGF23, which is called Clotho. Uh, so in this partial list, uh, I've shown a bunch of mutations that are responsible for this rare condition, but someone with normal renal function should not have hyperphosphatemia. And with that, Thank you very much for your attendance. And if you want to stick around, you can hear the same spiel in German in four minutes. Four minutes. Vielen Dank, Herr Lob. Schau mal, ich schicke dir eine E-Mail. Ich habe eine Frage und uh, vielleicht kannst du mir helfen.